The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are going to have a pastoral lesson. A lot of times we are teaching you the word for specific purposes. I'm teaching you uh, going down, let's say going down the trail and piece by piece I'm laying this foundation of whatever topic we're going through at that time. So like if we're going through the book of Hosea, We're doing chapter one, then we're doing chapter two, then we're doing chapter three. We're doing them in a specific order. But every once in a while, the Lord will just drop something into my spirit. The Lord will bring something to me. And we have what's called a pastoral lesson. So instead of me teaching you specifically for a purpose because of the subject that we're going through, I want to just sit and actually have a conversation with you today. I want to talk about something that the Lord is bringing up to me that will greatly benefit you. So today, we're going to be talking about this aspect of can versus should. What you can do versus what you should do. And what's the differences in the two and what is love and how does love operate in the midst of those? Because it's in the understanding of can versus should that you really see the heart of God. So it's going to be a very fun lesson today. We are going to get right into it. But before we do, we have finished all of our uh, week one for this quarter of our discipleship classes. So we had uh, topic number one, divine purpose on Tuesday night in our divine purpose curriculum. And then we had topic number one, beauty of Christ in our end times curriculum. And then we also re, we went through the trees in the garden in our discipleship curriculum on Monday night. So I just want to bring this up because if you are not following along every week, you're going to get behind very quickly because there is a lot of material. So you want to make sure you're doing your homework before class and you are attending every single week. That way you have all of the information and you're not getting one, two, three, four weeks behind and trying to play catch up, especially because the farther we get in the classes, the more material there will be because the revelation grows and grows and grows. So I always recommend don't get behind. If you've already, you know, missed the day and you haven't done it yet, you need to take today, get caught up, make sure you do all your work and make sure you're ready to go for next week. So before we get started, I'm going to pray and then we're going to right into this lesson today. And I'm just going to talk to you as a pastor. 
So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I was up this morning. And I was I was up this morning. The Lord just dropped this this phrase into my spirit. God dropped it into me, and I had to write it down because it was it was so powerful and it's so profound. Yet it's so basic in understanding. But I think sometimes we forget how important this truth is, and seeing who God is. So the truth that God dropped in my spirit, He said. The Bible is not a book of can and cannots, but should and should nots. Now that's an empower that's a that's a powerful phrase. Let me say it again. This is what the Lord dropped in my spirit. The Bible, the Bible itself, is not a book of can and cannots, but should and should nots. Now this is an this is an important thing and an important distinction. Because the understanding of yes, you can, but you should not, is really the understanding that we're looking at today. I've heard a lot of pastors teach on these different things and they say, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Well, the truth is you can. I tell people all the time, I said, you can go to hell if you want to. You just go by yourself because I'm not going with you. And I say that a little tongue in cheek sometimes, but... I'm very serious about that because you can make decisions that lead yourself to hell if you want to. Nobody's going to stop you. I remember I've, I've, I've said it many times. I've heard other pastors say it, but nobody goes to hell accidentally. Everybody goes volitionally. Everybody goes out of choice. Choices that you've made in life, things that you've decided, choosing not to receive Christ, choosing to walk in rebellion, choosing to live in sin. Nobody goes accidentally. Everybody goes by choice. That's why the Bible says they will be without excuse. God is a just God. Nobody gets to stand before Almighty God and say, I didn't know or somebody forced me or I didn't get the opportunity. Everybody has the same opportunity. You have to make decisions in life. And the decisions you make, you can't change. You can't undo them. Once the decision is made, it's made. It's already done. You can't change it. You know, you can't go back and redo things you've already done. That's why you need to take time and really think about things before you make decisions. You know, how does this decision honor God? How does this decision affect my life? How does this decision affect my family? How does this decision affect my call and purpose in God? Am I going to ruin my witness? Am Am I going to... Or let's not say ruin, but let's say it could hurt my witness. You know, am I professing Christ but living in sin? You know, how do how does, do other people see me as a hypocrite? You know, there, there's so many things in life that as you go down the trail, when walking out your purpose, this is one of the most important distinctions you need to know. And the reason why I make this distinction today is, And really the reason why I believe that the Lord has dropped this in my spirit about can versus should is the aspect that there is no liberation inside of you if it's a can versus cannot. If you feel like all it is is I can do this and I can't do that, then it produces bondage in your heart. There's no freedom in can versus cannot because it eliminates choice. It eliminates free will. One of the most important things I try to remind people is that God is love. And because he is love and because he walks out love towards us, it allows for choice to be made. God does not force you into doing anything. We talk about this a lot when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues is that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. I've heard that said ever since I was born again. I got filled with the Holy Ghost two months after I got saved. And that's what people used to say. And I still agree with it and say it to this day that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He'll never force you to do anything. He wants to work with you. He wants to work in conjunction with your spirit. He wants to speak through you. 
but the Holy Spirit will not force anything upon you. Just like the Father or the Son, no, God will not force you into anything. If you don't want to go to heaven, you don't have to go. If you don't want to live right, you don't have to live right if you don't want to. If you want to live in sin, you can. If you want to live in rebellion, you can. I think this is an important truth that we learned as we studied through the book of Hosea. That God will hedge you up. God will do things to, to hinder you in the path. He will do these things to stop you from going all the way. To try to hinder you from going. To try to slow you down in the rebellion so that you'll repent. But at the end of the day, if, if you become resolved, and you decide that this is what I want, God will allow you to go there. It'll only produce destruction and death in your life. But if that's what you want, you can have it. It's the deception of the enemy that if I can decide what's best for me, and if I can walk in my own will, because I know better than God, then I will make these choices in life and it'll produce freedom and life and happiness and joy. And the, the deception of it is it'll actually only produce destruction and death. You'll only feel an emptiness and a void. It'll never produce happiness. It'll never produce joy. Joy can only come from relationship with God. Relationship with the Father through the Son is the only place where joy is found. A deep-seated, well be a, a, a deep sense of well-being, happiness in all circumstances, the innermost part of your being filled. You're not feeling like you have this space or this void inside of you. It only comes from relationship with the Father through the Son and relationship with the Son through the Holy Spirit. And I, and, I, and I bring these points up today, and I know we haven't even read anything out of the Word yet. But I want you to really think about this. Because as your pastor, you know, I, I, I am a teacher. I, I teach through the Word. I'm very systematic when I teach. We go through Greek and Hebrew at different points. We, we, I lay out foundations. My degree from college was in communications. It was founded in rhetorical theory. So making sure you understand definitions and making sure you understand snares and all these different things are very important to me because I feel like it can give you true understanding of the Bible. You know, I, I have people that I minister to that when we go to churches or they go to churches and they hear things said, they they it makes more sense because they have deep undergirding truth because they actually know what's being said. Sometimes... You go into churches and they make statements without, without truly explaining it. For a lot of people, that causes great confusion. But there's one thing that I love to do. I love to teach. But today, I really feel like I need to speak to you as a pastor because the Spirit of God dropped this inside of me. And I don't speak this just to you. I speak this to me also. Because I think it's a truth we must never forget when walking at our purpose. That yes, you can. But you shouldn't always do things. Let's go to 1 Kings 17. I'm gonna, we're going to read these verses since we're talking about walking out purpose. And then we're going to jump into the New Testament. And uh, I've taught this before. I believe I've taught this before. If, if I haven't taught it, I've definitely ministered to others on this truth today. Uh, and, and it'll be good to have an actual teaching uh, through the website and through our YouTube channel on this to give you great understanding. You can always go back and reference this. But let's do this. Let's read 1 Kings 17 and then we're going to jump right into the New Testament. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering the sticks. 
And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And one thing you're going to notice here is that this, these truths that we pull out of 1 Kings 17 is not an aspect of can versus cannot. It's not like Elijah did not have the option to disobey if he wanted to. We're going to see if when we get to 1 Kings 19, we've mentioned it before and had a couple teachings on it already. But Elijah failed in 1 Kings 19. He, he did not, he made a mistake. Now, he did not make a mistake in rebellion. We're going to see that in 1 Kings 19 when we get there. I, I'm just referencing, referencing this today. But in 1 Kings 19, because of ignorance, Elijah fails. So it's not an aspect of whether Elijah could do it, whether he can or cannot. It's an aspect of whether he should or should not. I, I, I love these truths. We need to jump right into uh, the New Testament because we're gonna we're gonna look at this again. I'm not gonna read all of the passages because if we were going to read every bit that goes along with these two verses we're gonna talk about today, we would be here for a couple hours. But when we talk about just to give you a quick idea of the context of both of these passages that we're going to look at, is the context is the Apostle Paul speaking to the most carnal church. The Corinthian church is what would be considered the most carnal church. That's, that's a very wide, uh, widely held agreement, agreement in the body of Christ, that the Corinthian church was what they would consider the most carnal. They lived out of the flesh. They didn't live by the Spirit of God. You know, they were the most carnal. Now, even though Paul has the greatest explanation of the movements of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in the Corinthian church, it's because they are carnal. Because they're living so much out of the flesh, Paul needs to explain how to live by the Spirit and how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians 12. We're not talking about that today. But I just want to give you a context so you can think of who he's speaking to. And even in this, the context of the first passage that we're looking at deals with two different things, but the first context is dealing with marriage. And in the context of Paul speaking to the church about marriage and about uh, covetedness and adultery and all these things, in the context of Paul talking about sin to a carnal church, Paul makes a profound statement in 1 Corinthians 6. In verse 12 he says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So all things are lawful, meaning that I have the ability, I can legally do them. I can do any of these things. There is no restriction that holds me back from doing all of these things. And this is in the context of a church operating in sin. And Paul talking about people that are walking in carnality and walking in sin. Paul said, they're lawful. Yes, you can. Yes, you can do it. But it's not expedient. And that word expedient is not to your benefit. It doesn't benefit you at all to do that. It's very quite the opposite. Because yes, you can. But Paul said, if you do, you'll be brought under the power of it. Sin will have dominion over you. You'll start to be brought under the, the, the control of sin. And in the context of what it's talking about when it talks about body and idolatry and adultery and things of that nature. Yes, you could commit adultery, but there's things that will occur because of your sin if you do. And you'll be brought under the power of it. And today, and even then, but even today, you know, the aspect of committing adultery, you could uh, have problems at your workplace. I've known many people that committed adultery and, and their spouse showed up at their work. It caused a big scene. They lost their job, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, obviously divorce, the cost of divorce, 
I mean, these these things are consequences of your sin, and you you become you get brought under the power of it. The consequence of sin you can't escape. I'm telling you this today because yes, you can, but no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't go and commit adultery on your spouse. You should live faithful and holy. You should live in a purity state. Yes, you can commit sin, but no, you shouldn't do it. I'm telling you this today. I, I, I've spoke to many pastors about this. I was at a church one time, and we were talking uh, about diabetes, and we were we were we were, we were talking about uh, you know people that are overweight, you know, and they they have problems with diabetes. You know, I, me, I believe in healing and deliverance and all those kind of things. This it wasn't a conversation about healing. It was a conversation about how do you minister to these people and whether you should tell them that they can't eat those things or whether they can't do those things. And, and my stance that I took, which I still hold to this day, is you can't tell them they can't do it because that's not God. God will never say you can't because the truth is you can it's what God allowed when he made man. He gave man free will. He gave man the ability to make his own choice and to walk in his own destiny. That if man did not want God, man did not have to have God. But if man wanted God, they could have him. Man, man was given choice. And man was given choice because of love. Man was given choice. It says you were made a little lower than the angels. And that's because you are in a human body. Angels are not. And just being a little lower, you still have choice. Even the angels had volitional choice. Because they volitionally, one third of them, volitionally rebelled against God. And went with Lucifer when he was cast out of heaven. So it's not that you can't. You can. But you shouldn't. Because sin has consequences. The dominion of sin. The power of sin. Could ruin your life in the process. And we say ruin, God can restore and reconcile and redeem, but there's still consequences you might have to live with the rest of your life because of it. When Samson died, Samson killed more Philistines in his death than he did all the rest of his life. But when Samson died, Samson died blind. He didn't die with his eyesight back. When he lost his eyesight because of sin, he lost it forever. It was gone. He was not going to receive it back when he died. He, was, he died blind, with no eyes. Sin has consequences. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse, 20, verse 23. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23. And before I even read this, let's look. Let's 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 uh, let me give you some context to this. Now we're talking about a people walking in sin in First Corinthians six, and the context is really marriage and food and all those things. And the context in First Corinthians ten, it's dealing with the communion tables, the communion table, and idolatry. You know, worshiping of idols. And worshiping of idols in the natural sense has direct implication to harlotry and adultery and covetedness. You know, all those things go together. People don't just worship idols to worship idols. There's, there's always monetary gain associated with it. So there's a financial benefit or there's a sexual perversion benefit. Idolatry isn't just, I worship some other God to worship some other God. There's always other things associated with it. And then even after this, it, it goes into talking about money and idolatry again. So in the context, it's the same as 1 Corinthians 6. If you look at the broad stroke theme, is that there is sin and there is a truth that is associated with sin. And let's read in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So when you look at these, these two truths, the very first part of this truth is the exact same. It's the exact same wording in both verses. The only difference is the second part 
It's talking about being brought under the power of it or it edifying. Or edifying means also to build you up. Which means if it's not edifying, that means it's tearing you down. So this is important. And we're gonna, I'm gonna summarize this real fast and then we're going to finish for today. The Lord dropped in my spirit that the Bible is not a book of can and cannot. It's the book of should and should nots. Because the truth is, because God loves you, yes, you can. You can do whatever you want. You can walk in adultery and idolatry and covetedness and sin. You can do those things. But the truth you need to understand is that if you do, the consequences, the power of that sin, the, the, the tearing down that it will do in your life is a consequence of it. And Paul said you shouldn't do those things because they will tear you down. They will bring consequences in your life that will last your entire life. Because God loves you, God allows you to make the choice. And we should make the choice to live holy and to live for God and to not live in sin. Yes, you can, but no, you should not. And we're out of time today. So, Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you all the glory for everything you're doing in this truth. God, teach us that you have given us free will. And because you love us, you give us the option to choose. God, teach us to choose holiness and righteousness and purity and to stay free from sin. God, I give you all the glory for everything that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. I pray you have a great day. Please join us this weekend for Saturday and our daily teaching and Sunday, our, our sermon, our, our church on Sunday. God bless you. I love you. If you're in our classes, make sure you have your homework done. Make sure you've attended and we will see you tomorrow. Church, have a great day. The sparrows not worried about tomorrow or oh, the troubles to come. The lilies not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good care of me. And you know what I need before I even ask the thing. And you hold me in your hands with the kind The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Take good care of me You take good care